And this question deals with, again, when we talk about the days of Noah, and we've, we've certainly talked about the Nephilim, who are the half-human, half-fallen angelic hybrids, and how they were the reason for the flood and all the things that took place there. But what about animals? You know, I, I've received uh, this question a number of times in the last few weeks that what about the animals? Were animals a part of this sin by the fallen angels, this genetic tampering that took place in the days of Noah? And so um, I believe the answer is yes. And I think that we can, of course, demonstrate that in scripture that, we, that they were not just fallen angelic human hybrids, but even angelic animal hybrids and human animal hybrids uh, in the days of Noah and, um, and beyond. And I think even a potential return to that. And we're going to, I think, see some startling news about that as we continue uh, in our study tonight. So let's get started on question number two and go, of course, right to scripture. So we're going to go to Genesis 6 here. And of course, we, we this is the passage we look at all the time to talk about the Nephilim. But I'm gonna, I want to point out another detail here. Of course, it says that there were giants. And that term in Hebrew is Nephilim. For those who are new to the topic, that's where we get the term from. It's called translated as giants in scripture, in the Bible, in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And so we're going, to, we're going to skip ahead to the bottom there, to, to verses 6 and 7, which we don't discuss as much. It says, and it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. But then look at this detail. It says, it says both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So right here, we see that God is having this big regret. And, is, is, and of course, that term repent in the King James doesn't mean that God's seeking forgiveness. It means that he has completely changed his mind on his creation. And why? Because it, it become genetically corrupted outside of the creation. This is what we talk about with the Nephilim, all through Judgment Nephilim and the final Nephilim in many of our studies. But looking at verse 7, God also includes the animals. And so, and of course, again, throughout Genesis chapter six, God says all flesh has corrupted itself. So there was something in the animals that were corrupted too. And I think that they were a part of this genetic hybrid experimentation that the fallen angels were carrying out uh, in the days of Noah. And I think we see more evidence that this was the case, actually just continuing in the passage. So we're just continuing in Genesis chapter 6 and picking up at verse 12. And as I mentioned, it says, God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And then, but look what it gets to the instructions on now God's telling Noah that he's going to use him to reboot humanity after the flood. And of course, build the ark and bring the animals on the ark. And it says, and of everything of all flesh, two of every sort that you bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. This is, of course, talking about animals. But look at the description. It says of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall thou come unto thee to keep them alive. And of course, God brings the animals supernatural to, supernaturally to Noah and he puts them on the ark. But what's, what the key phrase here is after their kind. Was there a hybrid uh, genetic tampering of animals by fallen angels? I believe yes. And this is why God in what he's doing in the ark is just like with Noah. It says Noah was perfect in his generation. He was tamim in Hebrew. He was without blemish. And I believe that means he was genetically without blemish. God also wanted animals that were genetically without blemish, that were that were after their kind, meaning that's this is genetic language. It's the original creation that God made, that he wants a horse on the ark, not a half horse, half fallen angelic, or half Nephilim hybrid or half man hybrid, right? And so I think that's another big clue as to what was taking place and how God is correcting this thing. I'm not bringing all of these creatures through the ark they're not they're, they're not coming with they're not coming with us and so so i think the bible is really pointing this out and so let's look at some other examples here well actually let me see if i want to go here first where am i going to go first okay so 
Um, another thing I want to point out before we get to that, that passage is that this is also mentioned in the apocryphal books, right? In the book of Enoch, it says um, that explicitly that animals and beasts and fowls were that the, that the sons of God, the fallen angels or the watcher angels rather, were tampering with animals. And in the book of Jasher, it says that even men were learning how to mix the species of animals. So the apocryphal sources, which again, of course, are not divinely inspired scripture, also say the same thing. But I think there's even more confirmation when you think about heavenly realm creatures. And uh, this is something I love to talk to, uh, again, I spoke to blurry, blurry creatures about, but also L.A. Marzulli. I've had conversations about this idea that when you think about animals on Earth, right, everything that's happening in the earthly realm is a shadow of the heavenly realm. That there, are, I believe that there are heavenly realm creatures that, and, and they may not look like the creatures we have here, but they have creatures on in heaven as well. And I think the cherubim represents a type of heavenly realm creature. Um, I know it's controversial. Some people think Satan is a cherubim. I actually don't believe that. I don't believe he's uh, a cherubim. I think the Septuagint clarifies that he was a, among the cherubim because he was before the throne of God. But if you look at their appearance, we're going to look here, what I brought before, in Ezekiel chapter 1, where Ezekiel is having this supernatural encounter. God is coming down from his throne. And just look at how these creatures are described that he sees. And, of course, this is a very strange chapter. And I, I tell people all the time, I, I, I tell people all the time, we're going to go back to the verse in a second, that, you know, Ezekiel... It's a very fascinating book because he has more interactions with the angelic realm and the divine realm than, like, than any prophet in scripture, um, I think, in any book of the Old Testament. He's constantly in, in, interacting with God, with angels, with cherubim. He's seeing all sorts of things, divine creatures. And so, but let's go here and look at, at Ezekiel chapter 1. And it says, now it came to pass in the 30th, in, in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month. And of course, I'm just this is just verse one, as I, Ezekiel, was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened. So what do we, what do we have here? The veil, right, is being removed. And, you know, he also happens to be by a river. And Jedim and Nephilim might talk about the fact that angelic and divine manifestations often happen near rivers. But continuing, it says, and I saw the visions of God. And it says the likeness of four living creatures. These are the four cherubim at the throne of God that carry God through the air. And it says this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man and everyone had four faces. And already we're seeing some strange things. They have the likeness of a man. They have four faces. They have four wings. It says their feet were straight like the sole of a calf, right? So now they're like a cow and they sparkled like burnished brass. And so it says in the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a man of a lion on the right side, they had the face of an ox on the left side, and they also they four also had the face of an e of an eagle, and that's again Ezekiel one verse one and verses five to ten. So this is clearly a hybrid being. He has four different animals. It has four different animals on its body, right? It has the feet of a calf, as the likeness, the probably the body shape of a man, and has wings. So when you think about it from that perspective. There are hybrid beings already in the heavenly realm that have that are put together with composed of different creatures. So the idea that a fallen angel would know that they can come to Earth and manipulate animal genetics shouldn't be a surprise, right? It shouldn't be a surprise at all that they'd be able to to do this and have this knowledge and have this power and potentially even share it with humanity, right? Because I think a lot of what took place in Genesis six was the exchange of divine knowledge for a woman's hand in marriage. And if that doesn't seem convincing, there's an even more clear example of when angels use this ability to literally create an animal hybrid. And we find this in the book of Daniel. So let's go there. Oh, so this, this actually, oh, so before we get there, so this is an interesting passage. So just, just want to show you. So when you think about you know, the, uh, the centaur, right? I, I forgot to mention this. So you think about mythology, right? Like the centaur, which was a half horse, half bull or half man, the minotaur and these, you know, or Egyptian mythology, where you have, you know, a half man with a, a man with a bird's head. 
a man with a dog's head, the Sphinx. I mentioned some of this in our last week's Thursday Night Theology, right? This idea of a human animal hybrid, right? This is being represented in so many ancient cultures. And again, I believe it comes back to the days of Noah. So these are some commentaries that make this same point. Now, in, with respect to the centaur, it says that Bryant, quoting another author, uh, remarks that they, meaning centaurs, were reputed to be of Nephilim race. C64, meaning Genesis 64. So this is a book, the symbolical language of ancient art and mythology. This is a book of on mythology. This is in the Christian commentary. In 1892, and it directly connects the centaur to the Nephilim. And then I've quoted here Justin Martyr, who of course was a Christian writing in circa 125 AD. And he's talking about the Greek poets and mythologists, those who write mythology. He says, those poets and myth authors not knowing that it was the angels and those demons who had been begotten by them that did these things to men and women in cities and nations, which they related, um, ascribed them to God himself and to those who were accounted to be his very offspring. And, to, and so what he's saying is all these things you're reading about mythology and demigods and the Titans, it, this, is, this, was the, this was the fallen angels and their demon offspring. So he even understood that the Nephilim that their deceased spirits were the demons. He's saying it all goes back to the days of Noah. This, and they just don't even realize it, that this is where it's all coming from. And he talks about Neptune and Pluto being brothers and uh, that they're basically just a, a, the Greek iteration of what took place in the days of Noah. But the mythology, including these hybrid beings, come, I believe goes back to the days of Noah in Genesis 6 as well. But let's see if we can find what I was looking for here. Oh, okay, so this is the passage from Enoch here. And uh, where it talks about, again, they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish, talking about the angels. And then in Jasher as well, which says that the man taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other. But let's continue. Okay, here we go. So here's Daniel chapter four. And so just to set the tone, this is where King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, who had a, uh, quite a interaction with God through several chapters um, as God is humbling him and, and I believe bringing him to literally to his knees to submit and admit, confess that God is the most high God, Yahweh. Here he has this dream of this tree. He has this dream of this tree with branches. It's this huge tree and fruit and all the nations under it. And it's commanded to be cut down and a, bra a ring of iron uh, but put around it. And he goes to Daniel for the interpretation. Of course, at first he goes to his occult practitioners and they aren't able to get through the veil to actually find out the divine meaning of this dream because it came from God. But Daniel, of course, uh, can because he's blessed by God with this gift and God reveals, this is God revealed the secret to me of what this dream means. And he says, that tells Nebuchadnezzar that, that the tree in the dream is you, that you are this tree and it's, it's branches and all its might and its fruit represents your kingdom. He was the most powerful global ruler at that time as the emperor of Babylon. And it said that, however, the reason why I was cut down is so that you, if you, you've exalted yourself against Yahweh, and if you basically, if you don't repent and start doing right and being just and serving the poor and the things that God wants you to do as a righteous believer, you're going to get cut down. And it's, and of course, Nebuchadnezzar listens to this and is grateful. And then the next day, what does he do? He comes out, looks at his kingdom and says, I built all this. It's all me. It goes right back to being to prideful ambition. And look at how he's punished and how interesting it is. We're going to look at the, pronounce, the pronouncement of the punishment that was pronounced in his dream and then how it was executed in reality. And so this is starting in verse 15 to 17 of Daniel 4. And Notice what it says. It says that, that when he, if he was going to be punished, it says, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times or seven years pass over him. This matters by the decree of the watchers and by the demand of the Holy One. So notice it's the watcher angels who are making this decree. And it says, why? To the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom, kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and set it up over, the, over it the basis of men. Why is this punishment going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar? Because he has to be humbled to know that he doesn't control anything. 
Yahweh is in control. But look what he says here. The same hour was this thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And so he was literally transformed into a human animal hybrid. He lived as a beast for seven years. And look, notice, again, it's by the decree of the watchers. They had the power to decree that if he committed this sin of pride against God, he was going to be literally supernaturally transformed into a human animal hybrid. So clearly the Bible teaches that this is possible. And again, we see this divine foreshadowing, right? You think about this. You have this king who exalts himself over God, who is the most powerful person on earth, and he's turned into a hybrid man-beast for seven years, right? Sound familiar? It's a foreshadow of the Antichrist. The Antichrist in Revelation 13 is a man, but he's called the beast, right? He has the number of a man, 666, but it's called the mark, the number of the beast, Right. The scripture goes back and forth, calling him man and beast. Why? Because he is the hybrid. He is the ultimate and final hybrid, the final Nephilim on earth. And so I think Nebuchadnezzar in, in this punishment, in this judgment, by being literally turned into an animal, human animal hybrid was giving us a very stark foreshadow of what's going to take place in the end times. But again, you know, so as and as we think about the end times and things taking place, I wanted to, to point out one thing. And this is actually something I did an article on in my old blog. For those who know my old blog, Beginning and Ends, um, I did an article on this a long time ago, but it's still staggering to me is to, you know, again, we talk about as it was in the days of Noah. Are we already heading back to that phase of human animal hybrids? Could that be possible? Well, the answer is yes. And so look at here, you know, this article here. British scientists have secretly created more than 150 human-animal hybrids. And this is from the UK Daily Mail. It says scientists have created more than 150 human-animal hybrid embryos in British laboratories. The hybrids have been produced secretively over the past three years by researchers looking into possible cures for a wide range of diseases. The revelation comes just a day after a committee of scientists warned of a nightmare Planet of the Apes scenario in which work on human animal creations goes too far. And notice that article is from 2011, right? That's so who, if that was taking place 13 years ago in, in under secret research in a lab, and I put, by the way, I put the link to this article in the description of this video. So you can have, if you're interested in seeing it, um, because it's still up. Imagine where they are now in terms of seeking to make the, a hybrid, a literal hybrid being, right? And if you look in the article, it says that they think this is a good way to cure diseases. It's going to solve so many problems and ailments, right? And that's always the lore that this will help us. This will heal us, right? Rather than going to the great physician, we're going to make ourselves part lion or part tiger or part horse in order to heal ourselves, right? As it was in the days of Noah, right? Excuse me, this is exactly what Jesus pointed us to. So that is my answer on question number two. And um, I hope you enjoyed it and hope it sparks some good discussion. And let's see if we can get to some questions. Do a little live Q&A. Hey, All right, this is from Rachel. Where did the land of Nod come from or Node in Hebrew, right? So this great, great question. So what is the land of Nod? So the land of Nod or Node is uh, an area that Cain was sent to, was went to after he was banished from Eden. Cain, to recap, uh, was, of course, the first son of Adam and Eve. And he killed his brother Abel, his younger brother Abel. And I explained uh, last week and definitely explained in Judgment of the Nephilim how I believe that this was all because of the prophecy of Messiah, right? God had prophesied that there was going to be a seed born of the woman of Eve that was going to destroy the devil, to defeat him, crush his head. And therefore, the devil had to go on the attack against Adam and Eve's children, their sons, to make sure that wasn't going to happen. And so by corrupting Cain into killing his brother, that's effectively, he was disqualifying him ultimately from being Messiah. And so... God then banishes Cain from Eden, right? Adam and Eve were only banned from the garden. 
So they were still living in the area known as Eden. However, Cain is banished from Eden altogether. And again, God, I believe, did that out of mercy to allow Adam and Eve to have more children without the murderous Cain's influence. So then he goes to the land of Nod. And so where did the land of Nod come from? And so I would um, submit that there is a whole history on the earth before Adam and Eve. And again, this is really what I'm researching in my current book is what was taking place on the earth. And we can see clues of this in Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, when it refers to the Prince of Tyre and the King of Tyre. And I believe it's, that's an, it's essentially what I call an esoteric passage that is addressed, that's God's addressed in the devil and talking about him when he was still righteous and saying that he sealed up the psalm and he was perfect in beauty and wisdom and he wore a breastplate with the same stones that Aaron wore as the high priest, right? So showing you again his rank, right? I mentioned earlier that Satan was among the cherubim. That's where was Aaron? In front of the cherubim, right? At the veil and going to the cherubim on the day of atonement, on Yom Kippur. So I think the devil's in this, the exact same role. And he says, thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. So the devil was already on Eden, right? So he was, he'd already been in Eden when he was a righteous angel before he fell. And I believe that's before Adam and Eve. So how does that relate? So if that was the case. I believe that the, he wasn't alone, that the fallen, that the angels were on earth uh, before Adam and Eve. So you would have civilization. You would have areas with names. You would have cities, buildings, structures, megaliths. Right. You think about things like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey that completely smashes the paradigm of everything that's being taught in public schools in terms of when did civilization start. Right. They say everything started in ancient Mesopotamia 6000 years ago. Well, Gobekli Tepe, which is a, you know, megalithic structure with 10 ton stones, you know, basically what most researchers believe was an ancient shrine. And a complex of shrines, because now they've found more, or, or, and they're 10,000 years old. And you have these advanced structures with the carvings on them that are 10,000 years old that go way, way back before ancient Mesopotamia. And so I think that we're going to find more and more of that that gives evidence of an earlier civilization, at which I believe was an angelic one. So yes, I believe that that. So when you think about why would there be a, why would there be a place called Nod already? Because I think there were already there was already a geography on the earth before Adam and Eve? Great question. All right, let's see if we can get one more question in. Do we have another? Let me see what I can find here. Okay, this is from John and Sheila. Ryan, can you clarify your position on the timing of the rapture? You're often in Prophecy Watchers, and they are pre-trib, but I don't think you are. That is an excellent question, and I'll be happy to do that. So what is my position on the rapture? So um, I take a very unique position. So, of course, again, we're talking about the time of the rapture. Just for those who might be new, the rapture is when the prophesied removal of the church from earth, supernaturally being caught up, harpazo. So it's not, it's not death, actually, and it's not like natural human based travel it is supernaturally being caught up into the clouds with jesus to be taken to heaven and of course the, the three main positions are does it happen before the great tribulation in the middle or at the end after seven years the great tribulation the day of the lord are is over right and so where do i fall on that i i am a pre tribulation rapture believer. So I believe that we at the church, believers in Christ, believers in Yeshua are removed, that we will not experience everything I've been talking about in the end times, the return of the fallen angels, devil being cast to earth, all the deception, all those things. I don't believe we're going to experience it. And of course, the, the supernatural punishments uh, of God. Um, so I don't think we're going to experience that. But where I differ is when the rapture happens. So I don't believe, I believe that the rapture is before the great tribulation, but I don't believe it happens when people traditionally like prophecy watches and shout out to Gary Steering and Bob, love those guys. Those are my brothers right there. Um, they, the traditional teaching is that at the first seal, when Jesus sitting on, of course, at the right hand of the father opens the first seal of revelation, that that starts everything that that starts the great tribulation. And that is the moment of the rapture when the, when the church is 
caught up in the clouds to be brought to heaven with Jesus. Um, however, I don't believe that. I actually take a very different position and believe that, uh, I actually believe the first seal was opened uh, 2000 years ago. And why do I say that? I say that because if you look in Revelation chapter four and chapter five, where the where the scroll, the seven sealed scroll is getting prepared to be opened, it says that, you know, that they, there was no one found worthy. The ancient of days, God, the father is sitting on his throne. There's no one found worthy to open the scroll. It says in heaven in earth or even under the earth. So this to me indicates the timing has to be before the resurrection in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has won full victory. Matthew 28, Jesus says, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Because now, now he's won the victory over death, hell, grave, and sin. Because he's taken our, our sins upon him, right? Of course, common doctrine. And this is what we see, right? John starts crying because there's no one found worthy. But then it says, and lo and behold, it says, the lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And it says, he saw a lamb as if slain, a suddenly appear in heaven. That, and that language in Greek of lo and behold means out of nowhere, meaning Jesus supernaturally appears in heaven and now he is worthy so i believe when that takes place is that is literally the 50 days that we find in acts 1 where it says jesus appeared unto about 500 people for 50 days he was on earth meeting with the disciples encountering speaking to other people eating food showing proving that he is physically back to life and resurrected and then he ascends to heaven in a cloud and the angels say you shall go in the same the same manner he left he shall come back and so so I think that when he goes up in the cloud, that is when lo and behold, he appears before John and receives the scroll and then he opens it. And so I believe that's what that started it. And I think that what's where I put the timing of the rapture, I believe is at the sixth seal. And I'll give the short answer. I can get into a whole, we can do a whole episode on this, but uh, the, the short answer is why. So how do I know the timing is at the sixth seal? I believe the, the rapture is at the sixth seal because I believe the first four seals are opened in kind of rapid succession. And I think when you talk about the, the, the different riders that bring war, uh, famine, the white horse rider, I believe being spiritual deception and then death and pestilence. I believe those are spirits that are operating in the earth all throughout the church age. And then when you get to the fifth seal, it says that it, it, it reveals the martyrs who are under the altar. And notice again, that there's an altar before the throne of God, just like in the tabernacle, right? And prayers are often, incense is carried on that altar, by the way, in Revelation chapter eight. So again, this is all a reflection of the heavenly tabernacle and the heavenly temple. And the, the martyrs, of course, these are Christians who are dying for the testimony of Christ. They say something very interesting to God. They say, how long? How long until you avenge us? They're asking God, when are you going to go down to earth and initiate all the judgments of the great tribulation and avenge our blood? Because they've died for the testimony. And this is the only seal that's connected to time. And God says, wait a little while longer until the number of your brethren and fellow servants is fulfilled. And so what does that mean? I think God's telling them, there's going to be a certain a number of martyrs who are going to join you, your fellow servants who are going to die for me, for my name, the name of Yeshua. And when that number is reached, then I'm going down. And that is totally dependent on time. And so I believe we're living in that seal right now, that the, that the fifth seal has been opened. And of course, there are martyrs dying and being imprisoned and tortured every day in restricted nations where Christianity is banned. We may not experience that so much in America and be, even be aware of it, but it is definitely happening right now. And I think when we reach that point, that's when the rapture happens at the sixth seal. And if you look at the sixth seal, you have the sun uh, turns dark, the moon turns red, there's a great earthquake, the stars are shaken like figs. This is everything Jesus points out in Matthew 24 that he says is going to happen at the start of the great tribulation. And it all happens at one seal. And even the people on earth, the great people, the mighty people, the Illuminati, the kings, the, the all the great people on earth, they say, hide us, right? They say, because... The great day of the, the wrath of God has come and who is able to stand. So I believe the world knows God is now acting. And then finally, I said, this is the short answer. This is, this is how I do a short answer. Um, so I said, finally, uh, you know, when you get to Revelation 7, you see suddenly, lo and behold, this group, this multitude appear in heaven of all races, nationalities, tongues. It's, it's emphasizing how diverse this group is suddenly this super diverse group um 
because we're still going to have our ethnicities, by the way, in heaven, right? The Bible's very clear about that. Um, appear before the standing before the throne of God. And I believe that is us. If you are a believer in Jesus, that is the rapture church now appearing in heaven at the opening of the sixth seal. Hi, it's Ryan Peterson. Thank you so much for watching this excerpt of Thursday Night Theology. And if you want the full episode, you can click the video on the screen or find the link in the description of this video. And if you haven't already, what are you waiting for? Make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell so you can never miss out on any of my newest episodes, especially when I go live. And by the way, if you want to have one of your questions answered live on Thursday Night Theology, put your questions in the comment section of this video. So I get all my questions from my shows from the comment sections from all of you who are watching and enjoying the show. So put yours in and maybe it'll be on my next episode. So thank you again for watching. God bless and I'll see you next Thursday.